everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together we are the Minimalists. We're here with Malabama. Hi, everybody. TK Coleman. It's the most wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the most wonderful time of the year. Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we're talking to some listeners about clinging to books as well as some writing tips and publishing tips for aspiring writers. We also have an outstanding lightning round segment and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two and a half hour maximal edition of episode 375, where we answer four times the questions and dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash The Minimalist, or click the link in the description. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. Let's start with our callers. If you have a question or comment for our show, give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Kat on YouTube. Kat Mandu says, why do people hold on to books that they'll never read again? I Hmm. helped my sister move from a two-bedroom cottage into a one-bedroom duplex, and she insisted on taking boxes and boxes of books with her. Now she has to rent a storage locker for all the overflow. Oh, isn't a storage Hmm. locker just a purgatory for stuff? Yes, (laughs) it is. I was was thinking the best storage locker for books, though, might be like the library. Oh, (laughs) oh. Hey, tweet that. Yeah, right. <laughs> the best storage facility for books is the library. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It, isn't that nice, too? Because then you can, obviously, you can donate books anywhere if mm-hmm. you're no longer using them. But the fundamental aspect of this question is why do people cling the books mm. that they will never read or that they will never read again? Coming up later on the private podcast, uh, we're doing the home tour segment. And I took a photo of my office and you get to see my book collection. You get to see every book that I own. And one of the things that I do is I limit the amount of books I can bring into my home Mm. because I have just one bookshelf. And anytime I want to bring a new book into my home, What happens? I have to remove a book from that shelf because Mm. I just don't have the space for it. And what happens is when we hold on to books because we have the space for them. Mm -hmm. If we have the space for them, we feel compelled to then fill up the space with more and more books. Mm. The only reason I hold on to books now is, A, if it's on my reading list and I'm going to read it, in the not too distant future. So ideally within the next 90 days, Mm -hmm. or if it's a book that I regularly reference. So my favorite author is David Foster Wallace. I often go and I will reference a book of his. I'll read a chapter from one of his books that I've read a bunch of times. So I keep those books because I actually use them. Of course, I have some writing books as well that I reference for my How to Write Better writing class. Mm -hmm. And these are like textbooks that I'll use for grammar or for parts of speech, especially if I'm teaching lessons on on the How to Write Better YouTube channel. I'll Mm -hmm. use these books so I can teach these lessons because I'm not a grammarian. I'm not a lexicographer, but I don't need to be. If I have just a small select group of resources, I can Mm -hmm. go back to time and time again. However... We lie to ourselves. Hmm. I tell myself, I will read that book someday. So I better hold on to it just in case. Yeah. And that's a trap. Just in case is always a trap, Mm. especially with books, because you can tell yourself a story. I'm going to read that someday, but then someday never arrives. And the only thing that arrives is another bookshelf because I need somewhere to put all of these books that I'm never going to read. One last thing I'll say before I became a minimalist. I had about 2,000 books, some of which I actually read. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Most of them I hadn't. Now, why did I have them? Why every time I would go to a bookstore, I'd buy a stack of books Mm -hmm. because, oh, this one looks interesting. This one looks interesting. This one looks interesting. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. It happens, right? Because your intention is to read the book. Right. Of course. I want to read this. But what what was the other part of my intention? I want to look smart. Oh, yeah. And how smart will I look if you come into my house and I've got a giant bookshelf full of all of these impressive books. Well, look how impressive I am as a person. No, it's far more impressive to stop clinging. Mm. 
you, to let go. You know what would look really impressive if you just had a bookshelf and all it had had was Infinite Jest on there <laughs> by David Foster Wallace. Well, because, that book's on a lot of shelves, but very few people I've met have exactly. ever read it. Yeah, but it's yeah, funny because people like keep that. keep it on their shelves though because it is one of those books that's like. Um, you know, uh, very different from other works, mm -hmm. Mm. very hard to understand, but it's looked at as like a, um, you know, you're an intellectual if you can get through uh, Infinite Jest. I remember Josh was getting rid of a copy one time and I'm like, oh, I'm going to try and do it. He's like, don't, man, don't do it. He's like, you're not ready. You're not ready, man. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite books. I'd never recommend it to anyone. Yeah, yeah. I certainly wouldn't batter someone by by buying it as a gift for them either mm -hmm. it, it looks like a phone book and the, it's a million words so it's a it's a is it a legit book. million words yeah oh yeah. wow man yeah your, your average a, book's about sixty thousand words by the way yeah so. no it's a very thick dense book for sure for sure several hundred pages of end notes alone you know i find on my shelf like half the books i have on there which are in the home tour i did like a couple of weeks ago yeah yeah um they are our um, foreign translations mm. of our other books. Yeah. And that's like the one thing that um, I probably do collect a little bit because mm. like I love the different styles that the different countries go with. Yeah. Mm. Um, but again, I have like my container of here are the books that, you know, here's the amount of books I'm, I'm allowed to keep. It's uh, the bookshelf that I got off of you. Mm -hmm. I can even fit a couple board games on there because um, I don't have that many books. But yeah, half of those books I have, though, are definitely like the foreign translations of our book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, TK, it's not wrong to own books. <laughs> Is that is that like narcissistic of me to like <laughs> to keep those books? No, I keep one. I keep one copy of of each foreign translation as well. Mm -hmm. I, I look at it as art. Like I, yeah. I, I see. Wow, it's amazing that we have several dozen languages that our books are published in now. Yeah. And a lot of them, I can't even read the characters because it's in Japanese or it's in Korean, mm -hmm. and it's just impressive. But it looks like a, a work of art. It does. Yeah. A and so, yeah, I'll, I'll hold on to those books. But I don't have 10 copies of each either. And I think right. what is important here to understand is that it's not wrong to have books. The problem with books is book clutter. Well, what is clutter? Clutter is when anything gets in the way. Mm. And so if I have books that are getting in the way, well, what does that mean? They can literally physically get in the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was moving, I had those 2000 books, Ryan, you'll probably remember this. I had a, a box of books and I jumped down from the truck bed, your truck bed. On oh, your, yeah. And I threw my back out because yep. what a metaphor. <laughs> the stuff literally <laughs> made me throw my back out. <laughs> I'm I'm hurting myself with stuff. And yeah. that is when I realized like, mm. oh. I don't need to hold on to all of these. Some mm -hmm. of them I've read and I'm not, if I'm honest with myself, I'm not going to read them again so I can let those go. Mm, yeah. And there are others that if I'm honest with myself, I'm not actually going to read that. Or yes. if I really want to read it in the future, if I make the mistake of getting rid of it and I do want to read it, the public library is right down the street. I oh, can yeah. go yeah. check it out if I want to. Or if I absolutely want to repurchase it, I can do that as well. Do you remember the... um? The gentleman who came to one of our live podcast events. So this guy came uh, to uh, one of our events. He's asking a question. That, and his question was, I have about a thousand articles bookmarked on my, you know, Chrome or Safari, whatever he, he was using. Mm -hmm. And he was like, it really stresses me out because they are all, all things that I'm genuinely interested in. Mm -hmm. But I haven't read any of them. And the sheer amount of of what's bookmarked there, like it's overwhelming. So he really doesn't go and read a lot anyway, because it's too overwhelming. And I was like, man, I would like challenge you to just like delete all of those links yeah, and see how you feel. And I was like, you know, don't do it if you don't want to do it. I'm like, you know, I'm not trying to pressure you in, 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 into anything, but I would like challenge you to Ooh. consider that. Yeah. And uh, he's like, yeah, I will consider that. He sits down and then um, he got back up a couple questions later. He's like, I just deleted all those links. And he's like, he's like, I cannot tell you how freeing, how freeing it was. He's like, this weight was instantly lifted off my shoulders. Yeah. And what you're talking about is that was clutter. He had yeah. bookmark mm. clutter. Yeah. It was getting in the way, not physically, but mentally. Mm -hmm. And that's the other place in which all of these books get in the way. Yeah, physically, I can throw out my back mm. or it's just taking up too much space. It doesn't look great. Mm -hmm. it, and it's also, though, creating all mm. this mental clutter, the emotional clutter, the psychological clutter, and also the burden 
we start worrying like, oh, I'm not reading enough. Ironically, when I got rid of those 2,000 books, Mm -hmm. I began reading more. Yeah. Because the clutter wasn't in the way preventing me from reading. Yeah. Mm. It is crazy how the literal clutter of those links prevented him from ever going to that folder and reading the links. But to start over with a fresh start, like, yeah, I could see where that would be more encouraging to read. That's so good. Mm. Uh, This question makes me think of a moment in the office where Michael Scott says to the character Toby, who he hates so much, why are you the way you are? (laughs) This question is a variation of that, right? Why are you the way you are? And the first thing I want to say is anytime Mm. you can take another person's philosophy or practice and mock it, make it look completely stupid and say, (laughs) how could anybody possibly believe that or do that? It only proves that you don't really understand the philosophy or practice. Sometimes we say things like, I will never understand people who say this. I will never understand people who do that. And we put that out there as if it's a signal of nobility or virtue, when in reality, it's a weakness, not a strength. Mm -hmm. We should always strive for more clarity and more understanding, even about those things with which we disagree. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't endorse what they do. I don't agree with what they do, but I totally get it. I can understand why a person would be triggered to do that. I can understand why a person would be incentivized to do that because that understanding puts you in a position where you can be empathetic, not for the sake of saying you're empathetic, but that empathy gives you influence because it allows you to speak to people, not from a higher up place of being on the pulpit lording over them, Mm -hmm. but speak to them as an ally, as a person that's truly supportive of their success. The next thing I'll say is that when it comes to books or anything else, Letting go isn't just about the stuff that we need to sell. Mm. It's also about the stories we tell. Anytime you let go of anything, it can be a person, it can be a possession, it can be a place. Anytime you say goodbye, you're also choosing to completely walk away from those aspects of your life that were oriented around whoever or whatever you're saying goodbye to. Mm. And that means you got to learn how to tell a different story. And so it's important to be gracious to people who are grieving a loss or struggling to say goodbye to something, even if you look at it and say, well, that relationship's toxic anyway, or that book isn't even that important because there's a story behind what they're trying to let go of. And that story is holding their lives together in some kind of way. And if you can engage that story with curiosity, you can help them evolve that story. Mm -hmm. But you can't help someone evolve a story that you yourself don't understand. So instead of saying, hey, why won't you let that thing go? You can say, why is it here in the first place? Why did that thing ever matter to you? And what is it holding together in your life? And once you hear that story, you might surprise yourself and say, oh, don't throw that away. Hang on to it. Because if that person tells you, I got a thousand books because I'm opening up a used bookshop, you wouldn't want them to get rid of it. You say, hold on to it. That's value capital, right? Mm -hmm. So that story might make you say, hang on to it. Or the story might make you say, yeah, I still think you need to let it go. But now I understand how to help you do that in a way that's conducive to the role that it's played in your life. You can only help a person tell a new empowering story when you stop condemning them forever having the old one in the first place. What I'm hearing here has a lot to do with letting go. If Mm. it's getting in the way, let it go. If you have a book or a collection of books that are getting in the way, it's okay to let them go. If you have a living room full of excess stuff, a closet with too many t-shirts or pairs of pants or shoes, it's okay to let it go. If you have toxic relationships in your life that are getting in the way of your peace, your contentment, your happiness, it's okay to let it go. All of these things are clutter. And what we want to do is not completely eliminate all the clutter from our lives, but understand what is clutter. And we can begin to let it go one by one by one. The reason I say you'll never eliminate all of it is from time to time, something that serves you today will stop serving you tomorrow. So Mm. it's not clutter today, but the thing that is serving you today might be clutter tomorrow. So we have to keep questioning. We have to figure out what that story is because the story we told ourselves before about the thing isn't necessarily the true story today. Mm. And therefore, It's okay to let go. Mm. We have a question from Instagram. Steven has something for us. 
I have been an aspiring writer for some time, and your 15 ways to write better ebook and how to write better YouTube channel have given me the final push to actually get started. After accumulating a bunch of ideas in a notebook, I'm finally turning them into a book. Once the book is done and I'm happy with it, how do I go about getting it published? First off, Stephen, congratulations on finally getting up the courage to sit in the chair to do the writing itself. You're no longer an aspiring writer. You're actually writing. Uh, Folks who are listening to this, if you want to check out the free ebook, it's called uh, 15 Ways to Write Better. Uh, That's the one he's talking about. It's just howtowritebetter.org. You can download it for free. And then the YouTube channel he's talking about is uh, youtube.com slash howtowritebetter. I do some pre-lessons over there. I also teach a a four-week writing class. And in there, the fourth week, we talk about publishing. But let's just say this, don't get ahead of yourself. Now, I know the reason you're asking this question is because you're looking toward the horizon. And we often want to have the perfect life, the perfect book, the perfect publication. And you're so worried about the outcome that you forget about the process. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, Stephen, the most joyous part of writing a book is not publishing the book. Mm -mm. In fact, there's a whole lot that goes into publishing the book where that's the business, the administrative side, the formatting, the alpha readers, the beta readers, going through the editing process and cover design. All those things can be fun and joyous and exciting, but the most joyous part of writing, sitting down in that chair and focusing and losing sight of the rest of the world because that story begins to come alive on the page or that blog post becomes alive on the page. You can sit down what TK does with his tweet storms there. That's not just poetic and beautiful. It's communicative and expressive, but also what you do TK is I can tell how focused you are on something. This is a writing exercise for you that you use Twitter to express yourself. And it's just another medium. Mm. I don't care where, and by the way, that's publishing. What What is publishing? Mm. I mean, in fact, even on Twitter, there's a little button that says publish, publish right? Yeah. Mm. And so uh, same with the blog. Whenever we post a blog post, it says publish. Mm. Now we think about publishing, it's how do I find a traditional publisher? Mm-hmm. And then how do I go through the nine months of all the rigmarole of once my book is handed in? Yeah, I get it. That's what a lot of people want. But as an author, this is a great term our friend Colin Wright coined. He's an (laughs) authorpreneur. I like that. I like that. Because, yes, it is important for you to promote your book, to get it out there. You write to be read. There's no question about that. Otherwise, you'd just be keeping a journal, which is fine, too. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is writing for publication. But there's so many different ways to be read now that doesn't involve going the traditional route. In fact, Ryan and I have four books together. I also wrote a novel. And um, those four books, three of them are independently published. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's a difference between self-published and independently published. We started our own publishing company back in 2012 with Colin Wright, mm-hmm. Asymmetrical Press. We published books for nine different authors. It was a beautiful experiment. We don't yeah. still publish books for other authors, but we learned a lot about that. In fact, we wrote an entire six-part series called How to Publish an Indie Book. Hmm. And the way I look at it is sort of like a, a garage band versus an indie rock band. Self-publishing is like, fine, it's just a, it's a garage band. You're in there with your friends and you're just jamming, right? Mm -hmm. Indie publishing is doing all the same stuff that a a major publisher would do, all the quality control, the distribution, all of those things, but doing it on an independent level, doing it on your own. And it's incredibly Mm. rewarding. And we've gone through traditional publishers for all of our foreign books, obviously, but Mm -hmm. also for our last book, Love People Use Things. And what I learned from that process, even though I really enjoyed the book, I don't like being beholden to major publishers. Yeah. And I I don't see a world in which I continue to do that. I much rather go the independent route and retain ownership, control, and the flexibility of doing it on my own. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I'll put a link to that series, uh, How to Publish an Indie Book, in the show notes. You can find the show notes at theminimalists.com slash podcast if you're interested in reading about the entire soup to nuts process. 
Yeah, you know, uh, and if you do go a traditional publishing route, uh, it's important to keep in mind that that publishers look for evidence of momentum. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we're in the middle of the creative process, we want to wait until we have something really beautiful and then we can show it with the world because the last thing we want is for people to see the messiness of our creative process. But it can be very helpful to adopt some form of working out loud so that you are teasing it out and letting the audience know something good is coming, something mm -hmm. cool is coming, so that by the time you drop it, people have been prepared for it. And when publishers evaluate your book, they can look you up and they can say, oh, here's someone who has some momentum. They're already doing cool stuff, saying cool things. We're not going to be the only ones doing the work of marketing this. They already have an audience. They already have a habit of putting themselves and their work out there. Lastly, I think of the words of Zig Ziglar who said, sales is a transference of feeling. Anytime you're promoting something, the way you feel about it is going to affect the attitude of the people you're promoting it to more than anything else. So one of the best things you can do to get that work published is to actually write something that you feel passionate about. Everyone says, to the point of it being a meme, I hate sales. What mm -hmm. that really means is, I hate pushing products on people that they don't want and that I don't believe in. I hate feeling like I'm twisting other people's arms to get them to buy something that I and they know they don't actually need. But when it comes to recommending things that we believe in, everybody turns into a salesperson then. You see a movie that blows your mind, you read a book that's amazing, you eat a meal that's delicious. What do you do? You grab your friend by the arm and you say, yo, you gotta, you gotta check out this place. Mm. You gotta read this book, you gotta watch that movie. And that feeling transfers. And so if you want to sell well, don't focus on the money. Don't focus on the, I need people to read my book so I can pay my bills. Mm -hmm. Write something that makes you feel like, ah, oh, I can't wait for the world to read this. Oh man, I'm so excited. Everybody needs to read this. Even if I got to give out a few copies because that feeling will ultimately transfer. And you'll be like that teacher in school who even though they teach a boring subject, makes everybody pay attention because they're fired up about it. That's yeah. the best gift you can give to the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I love what you're saying because um, I think we're all selling something. The question is, is what are you selling? And do you believe in it? I remember our first uh, book, book tour stop um, in Orlando. We were with a bunch of uh, couch surfers mm -hmm. and um, what an awesome group it was. And someone asked a question and we were torn with uh, minimalism, live a meaningful life. And he asked a question and I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm going to give you like a high level. I'm like, and I'm, but I'm not trying to like sell you anything, man. I'm like, but you know, in our book, like we, we literally write exactly about what you're talking about, you know, much more in depth. You might find value in that book. And he's like, why are you so trepidatious to sell your own book, man? And I'm like, I just don't want you to feel like I'm pushing something on you. He's like, but if you believe in it, like it's okay to, to be excited about something that you truly mm. believe in. Mm. And it's shifted my whole context. Like, I mean, just that first tour stop, thank God. Um, because we've been on a million tour stops since then. That's right. Um, but yeah, it's all about like, yeah, wh what are you selling? Because we're all selling something for sure. And how, how do you feel about that mm -hmm. thing that you're creating? If you're just wishy-washy, it's why I don't have a problem talking about our books on this podcast. And the reason I don't have a problem with it is because these are books that I believe in, that yeah. we put our blood, sweat, and tears and and oftentimes spent a year plus on mm -hmm. a book with love people use things it was over two years writing that book and mm -hmm. so i feel great about the book and yes i write to be read it doesn't mean that i think you should read the book but if this topic interests you that's exactly why i wrote this because if i could simply like ryan if i could answer the question in one paragraph then I wouldn't write the book. You write a book because you have something more to say. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's key for Stephen and anyone else who's considering writing is sometimes it doesn't require a book. Sometimes a blog post is sufficient. In fact, it's better as a blog post. I've seen this quite often where someone writes this yeah. viral article for The Atlantic or The New Yorker and it's awesome and then they get some great publishing deal to expand that into a book and it's like, oh, no, you sort of lost the essence of the thing because mm. it's no longer that thing that really resonated with people. And so sometimes a tweet will do. Sometimes it takes an entire book-length project. You can't do infinite jest in a tweet. It's a million words. Mm. I can tell you my favorite line from infinite jest. It's um, everything I've ever let go of has claw marks on it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Ryan, what time is it? 
Oh, you know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow us on TikTok. Also, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, and Twitter, at The Minimalists. During the lightning round, so Ryan and TK and I do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place as well. Minimalmaxims.com. Looks like Tatiana has a question from TikTok. When you talk about developing habits for writing, are these methods specifically for writing books or writing in general? Hmm. Hmm. Well, you want to put some time on the clock? We got 60 seconds here. Maybe we start with uh, T.K. Coleman. Hmm. What uh, what Kitty Lattimore <laughs> lyrics are you going to quote today? <laughs> you want to be a good writer, listen to Brian McKnight and read the lyrics. <laughs> All my writing comes from boys to men. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Okay. Bad writing is the initiation ritual into good writing. Mm. When it comes to writing, the question isn't, do you want to be good or are you already good? The question is, are you willing to be bad? long enough to become good. I forget who the writer was who said it, but he said something to the effect. It was it was actually whatever the writer's name is, the one who wrote Tarzan mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, the Princess of Mars. But he says that, that every writer has uh, thousands of words of bad prose in their soul. And writing is the process of purifying your soul of all the bad prose that you have. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're writing in general or writing a book, ultimately writing begins with a confrontation with the truth of who we are and a willingness to allow the world to see us for who we are in that vulnerability, in that honesty, before we become beautiful. That's how you get beautiful. It's like being physically fit. Unless you're willing to look out of shape, you don't actually get into shape. Mm. Ooh. Mm. Right in time, TK Coleman. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Nicodemus, you got 60 seconds. What do you got for us? Oh, man. Uh, my pithy answer is this. A pleasant life is composed of unpleasant habits. So it doesn't matter if you're writing, it doesn't matter if you're playing guitar, you are going to have to put in the work to be an expert at whatever it is that you're trying to do. Mm. So with your writing class, Josh, yes, it's about writing fiction. It's about writing nonfiction. It's about writing emails. It's about writing, you know, uh, uh, social media posts, whatever it is. Um, if you want to be good at something, you've got to put in the work. And here's the thing about a purpose. We're all looking to, to have a purpose. Mm. Where's my purpose? TK, where's my purpose? I need to have a purpose. As if we want to like possess a purpose mm. and you cannot possess a purpose. You can serve a purpose, but there is no ownership with the purpose. But here's the thing. When you serve a purpose and you serve it well, that purpose will have you. And all those unpleasant things that are a little bit unpleasant makes them just a little bit more pleasant when it's driven by your, the purpose you're serving. Ooh, Come on, baby. That was nice. a half court shot at the buzzer. <laughs> TikTok that, Danny Unknown. What I love about what you're both saying here, before you put 60 seconds on the clock for me, it, you're both touching on something that I think is, is crucial here. We often want to possess something, mm. but when writing becomes another possession, mm. yeah. well, then it be, can become clutter. When yeah. you have to do it, that's not what we're talking about here. You get to do it. However, what Ryan is illuminating, there will be resistance oh, I don't feel like sitting down in the chair today to do the writing because there are all these other things that are easier to do. I have all these other excuses. I used to have a checklist of 15 different things I had to do before I started writing. I have to fold the laundry. I have to make sure the dishes are washed. And then you, all of these things. And of course, I do 13 or 14 of them, but there was always something else to do. So I never actually wrote. How did I start writing? I decluttered the checklist. I decluttered the to-dos. You, you can make only one thing a priority, right? And so writing became the priority. The first thing I do when I get up is I write. I don't have to worry about anything else. I have no other rules. The first rule is to wake up. The second rule is to write. And that is it. It is that simple. Give me 60 seconds and I got something pithy for you. A habit is a byproduct of doing something compelling. And so if you hate writing, 
I wouldn't suggest sitting down every day to do the writing. However, if you feel the resistance because you know it's going to be a little bit more difficult than folding the laundry, I say yes. That resistance is actually a beacon. It shows you the direction in which you want to go because if you find writing compelling, then you're also going to be resistant to it. Anything that is worthwhile, you are going to experience a little bit of resistance. It's almost like your body saying, no, 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 there's something easier out here. Well, simple ain't easy, but it is simple to get up every day, to sit in that chair for one hour, put the words on the page, stare at that blinking line, and do the actual writing. I don't care about you being a writer, I just want to see you writing. Yeah, baby. My man says no. simple ain't easy. No, mm. no, it ain't. No, it ain't. Mm. You know what you were talking about makes me think about um, our really good friend, Matt Diavella, who directed uh, both of our documentaries. Um, remember he, cause he wanted to uh, uh, talk about his version of minimalism and talk about his story. And you remember like he started a blog yep. and mm. he was like, you know, just typing away, typing away, posting away. And he got to a point where he was like, I don't thoroughly enjoy this. Like this it's, isn't my medium. This isn't my medium. And and we're like, no, dude, like you're a film guy. Like that's your medium. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so that's where, you know, he started his YouTube channel and stuff. And that was so compelling to do the video aspect that he couldn't not do it. Right. And um, now he is way more popular than us. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to Matthew. Yeah. Let's check in with our Patreon live stream in a moment. But First, real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Since we're talking so much about writing today, just real quick, my four-week online writing class is called How to Write Better. I only open it two or three times a year, 48 hours only, 100 students only. It opens up February 17th. So mark your calendars. If you head on over to howtowritebetter.org, put your email address in there. We'll notify you when the course opens. You can be one of the 100 people who sign up for that. It's only open for 48 hours and you can interact with the other students and it's an interactive class, four weeks, and we will show you how to build the writing habit, how to write, how to rewrite. There's a whole mm. week on editing and there's a whole week on publishing as well howtowritebetter.org for more details. Let's check in with the Patreon live stream, Alabama. What do you got for us? We've got a question here from Amy. She says, clinging to books is a very timely topic. I made a first pass at my bookshelf over the weekend. I know I have more to release, but I'm not sure where to go with them. Calling the local library is on my to-do list, but what other ways can I intentionally give away my books? Mm, I'll tell you yeah. how I do it typically is I will go to those free local libraries, the neighborhood libraries. Yep. Mm -hmm. The little libraries. Yes. I adore those. Yeah, the those little libraries. Great. Yeah. Remember when our last book came out, Ryan, Love People Use Things, and we did uh, these little libraries, I think, in 200 cities across oh, yeah. uh, across America. Yeah. And we even autographed some books and went and put it in like people did a scavenger hunt to try to find advanced copies of Love People Use yeah. Things. Yeah, that was fun. I love the little neighborhood, little libraries. And mm -hmm. there are websites. In fact, I don't remember off the top of my head, but we'll have podcast Sean put a link to, there's a, a website that shows you where the closest little library is to your home. So they're just these like giant mailbox looking things. Mm -hmm. They usually have a see-through window and, and there are a bunch of books in there, but quite often they get depleted really quickly. And so you can donate your books to your neighborhood and so your community can now get value from those books. I, I picked one up the other day from uh, maybe about a, two weeks ago. It was a Kafka book, um, The Metamorphosis. And I was like, I haven't read Kafka since like my mid-20s. And I was able to dive back in. I was just walking by it and I saw it. It caught my eye and there it was. And so you can declutter, but also add value to other people's lives, whether it's donating to the library selling books to your local bookstore. That's another place that I do. A uh, local bookstore up in Ojai. Yeah. They have, they allow you to sell your books to them. Now you don't get a whole lot, but I sell a bunch of books enough to I can buy one used book from them and I'm not spending any money. Yeah. yeah. What, what did we do when we were up there? We have like a first line battle. Oh uh, like yeah. Pick a random book. Uh -huh. That's one of my favorite things to do. I yeah, go to a bookstore with friends <laughs> and we'll just grab a book off the shelf and we, we read the first line. It, it's something I teach in the writing class called narrative urgency. 
does this first line make me want to read the second line? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if so, that's a great first line. But a lot of first lines are like, oh, in fact, we did a video, put a link to this in the show notes, uh, Bill Clinton's boring oh first my line. God. Yeah. And it, it came from that, that trip up yeah. to the bookstore up in Ojai. It did. Do you remember the line? No, it's so boring, but I, I remember the line. I remember how I would have rewritten it. Mm, and so yeah. he talks about, in 1944, I was born in a beige. Uh, da, da. And it's just like, it's all communication, no expression. Mm. He talk, but he was born in Hope, Arkansas. Yeah. Think about this. Here's a great first line for, for Bill Clinton. It's on whatever the date was. Yeah. On December 14th, 1944. I was born on the outskirts of hope. Yes. Oh, dude. Hey, but see, come on. That's, oh, yeah. Man. Here's, here's the thing, though. Hmm. No, no serious stinker or writer ever dreams of sounding like someone who's running for office. Because when you're running for office, you, you got to neutralize yourself and be as universally appealing mm. and inoffensive as possible. I'm mm. not arbitrarily hating. This isn't the anti government tweet no, of the week. But no, you know what man. I mean? Like, like you, you got <laughs> you to always appear polished and you, you can't admit what kind of music you really like. You got to hide behind classical and jazz because it has the least amount of obviously <laughs> offensive con- you know, content. Nobody's going to be like, you know, my favorite musical artist is, you know, Eminem or something right. like that if they're running for office, even mm. if they really believe that. Yeah. And so, this goes back to you got to bring your personality to it and not just follow prescriptions. You hear it in public speeches all the time. I mean, how many public speeches have you heard where it's like, we live in a society that, <laughs> you know, in the year 1955, mm-hmm. it's like, come on, give me you. Yeah. Give me you. Do something that could possibly be wrong. Yes. You yeah. know? No, yeah. that's a good observation. Like, you got to be more vanilla when you're yeah. running for office. And yeah, I, I get that. It translates to the book, but it doesn't make the book compelling. And yeah. if you start... The book with I was born on the outskirts of hope. Yeah. Oh, I want to read the next line. Mm. And I think that's what compelling writing does. It propels you yeah. to the second line. The second line propels you to the third, so forth and so on. We'll get back to the Patreon live stream here in a little bit. But first, Mel and Bam, what do you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, fellow minimalists. I just wanted to leave this tip because it has been um, a recent shift in my way of thinking. On the podcast, when I used to hear people or even Josh and Ryan discussing like consuming consciously and thinking about the companies where they purchase things, I felt like that was too much work to do the research behind companies. Uh, And recently, I've kind of realized that my power in a way comes from the things that I'm spending my money on um, in our current society. And so it actually seems like a very small price to pay to do the research and purchase products from places that care about the environment and that treat their employees well, uh, because I suppose the alternative is spending money on goods and places that maybe don't care about their employees and don't treat the environment well. And then if I am purchasing from them, then in a way I am supporting those behaviors which don't align with my values. All right, y'all, that is our minimal episode for today. We'll see you on Patreon for the full two and a half hour maximal edition of episode 375, which includes four times as many questions from our listeners, a private minimalist home tour, our obsolete object segment, of course, TK's tweet of the week. We've got an outstanding added value segment for you as well, as well as an argument with one of our listeners. TK sets them straight. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you get access to all of our archives over there on Patreon, all the way back to episode 001 and much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, patreon.com slash The Minimalist. That's where you find The Minimalist private podcast. Subscribe. You'll get your personal link. So our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. Whew. All right, y'all. We leave here today with just one message. Let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works thanks for listening y'all we'll see you next time peace every little thing you think that you need every little thing you think that you need every little thing that's just feeding your greed oh I bet that you'd be fine without it